Hey, it's Vision Sunday, everybody, and uh, I'm excited about what I wanna teach you today around Vision Sunday. I wanna start with two verses, two passages from the book of Nehemiah. You can follow along with me here on the screen, and, uh, and then we're gonna jump into the message today. First, uh, I love this from Nehemiah. It says, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, um, Oh, that's a lot of information. While I was in the citadel of Susa, Hannah and I, one of my brothers, here's the important part, came from Judah with some other men. And he questioned them about how the remnant was doing, the ones that survived the exile. How are they doing? And this is what they said to me. Those who've survived the exile are back in the province and they're in great trouble. They're in great trouble. There's a problem and they're disgraced. And he says this, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. The wall's broken down and the gates have been burned with fire. So Nehemiah gets a report and the report is this, there's a big problem. There's a big problem, there's a big challenge. So Nehemiah was moved by God and, and he was moved with compassion to go and be a solution to the problem. And, and so let's jump over to chapter two. He goes in and he observes all the city. They say he got on horseback and he looked all around. And then this is what he said. Then I said to them, to all the people, the, the exiles, the one that were, that were still around, he, he said to them, he said, you see the trouble we're in. He said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. We're in trouble. Jerusalem's in ruins. The gates have been burned with fire. But then, then he says this, but come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we'll no longer be in disgrace. And he said, I also told them about the gracious hand of God that was upon him. The king had said, and the king gave him all kinds of favor. And then this is the response of the people. Let us start rebuilding. Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. They just didn't talk about the good work. They began the good work. They didn't just philosophize about the good work. They actually started the good work. They just didn't, you know, have some strategy around the good work. Come on, they actually put their hands to it and they began the good work. I wanna to talk to you about building a life worth living today. Talk to you about building a life worth living. Let's pray together. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that the word of God would transform our lives and our mind. Our hearts would be open to everything you wanna to say to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Amen. I want to talk to you about building a life worth living. And, and this is around the idea of vision. It's Vision Sunday, so here, you know, you kind of cats out of the bag. We're going to talk about vision today, everybody. And there's really two types of vision when you think about it for your life. You, I don't know if you know this, but you should have vision for your life. You should have a vision for your life. And, and a vision is simply this. A vision is a picture of a preferred future. A vision is a picture of a preferred future. It's, it's, I'm not necessarily where I wanna be, but I have a picture in my mind of where, I wanna, of where I'm going or where I, I desire to be. I may not necessarily, in business, I may not necessarily want the company to be where it is now, but I got a vision of where it's gonna be. I, I may not like where the church is now, but I have a vision of where it's gonna be. I may not like how society is right now, but I have a vision of where society could be. And so vision is a picture of a preferred future. It's saying, I don't like where it's at right now, but I got a preferred future out in front and I, I can see it in my mind. Vision is the ability to see that. Uh, and, and here's what's good about vision is that you often see it before everybody else sees it. You see it before your family sees it. You see it before your employees see it. You see it before your friends see it. That's the nature of a vision, and I think there, there's another way that you can look at vision, and it's this, it's a solution to a problem. This is what Nehemiah was saying to the people. There's a problem, the walls have been torn down, and I've got a vision, it's a solution, we're gonna go rebuild those walls, and so let's begin this good work together. It's, it's, a, it's a picture of a preferred future, but it can also be a solution to a, to a problem. And here's the thing about vision. I think there's kind of two types of it, maybe more, but I don't need to just give you two today. One is this, there's a vision that you do, and then there's vision about what you become. 
There's vision about what you do. I've got a vision to go do something. I, I've, got a, I've got a vision for, come on, I've got a vision to remodel my home. So, so that's something I've got to do. Are you following me? I'm gonna get new countertops. Gonna get, that's something I, I do. I've got a vision to do something. I wanna replace something. I wanna remodel something. Um, I wanna build something. I, I, want to, I wanna make something where there is nothing. I, that's what I'm gonna do. Everybody shout do. Yeah. Come on, in your home, say it with me. There's a vision to do, shout do. Then there is a vision, I think, when it comes to your life of what you're becoming. And it's two different things. I think God has a vision for what you should be doing with your life. I wholeheartedly believe it. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God has a vision for your life. That's a divine vision. And, and that divine vision is the thing that will help you progress in life. I love the way Proverbs says it. It's, it's a very familiar passage. It says, where there is no revelation, one, one, one version says, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. The, the King James I grew up on says, where there is no vision, the people perish. This is true for your life personally. Where you have no vision or you have no revelation of a preferred future, where you have no revelation of what you could become, then you cast off restraint. You perish. You cast off restraint. Here, here's what the, the idea of that is that vision for your life gives you guardrails. No one really wants to live without guardrails because you're aimless. You're, you're schizophrenic. You're, you're like a, a weed that is just blown around in different directions. You're going this direction one day. You're going this direction the next day. You're going back this direction. And you never make progress because you don't know where you're headed because you got no revelation of a preferred future. You got no vision of where you want to go. And here's what I want to say. I think many of us lost vision for our lives in the past season. We lost vision for our life. We're, we're just like, I don't know which way I'm going. Can I leave my house? Can I not leave my house? Should I stay locked down? Should, can I not? And, and it was like, which way am I going? And we lost a sense of a compass. We, we lost a sense of a, of a true north in our life. We, we lost a sense of vision in our life. And so we're, we're casting off restraint. We, we have no guardrail for living. We, we don't know the path. We, we don't have any way to guide us because we lost vision. And I, I want to tell you, God has a vision for your life. God has a very clear vision for your life. And it's this, and I can tell you what it is. I don't know the, the details of it. I don't know if you're supposed to start that business or not start the business. I, I don't know if you're supposed to marry her or not marry her. I just spent a whole lot more time with you. I don't know if you're supposed to make that investment or, or not invest in GameStop. You should a few days ago. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what, what you're supposed to do. But here's what I do know is is that if you don't know God, God wants you to know him. I know that 100% that God wants not know about him, not, not have some religious box that you check, but God wants you to know him. He wants every lost child found. He wants you to know God. I know, number two is I know that God wants you to find freedom from your yesterdays. I know without a, without a shadow of a doubt that God wants you to deal with your yesterdays so you can be everything he wants you to be in all of your tomorrows. Without a shadow of a doubt, that's the vision of God for your life. I know without a doubt that according to the scriptures, God's vision for your life is that you would discover purpose for your life. That you wouldn't live life without purpose, aimlessly walking around, why am I on the planet? That, that question, God can answer for you. And then that you would use your life to go make a difference. Without a shadow of a doubt, the end goal of every believer is not to know God. The end goal of every believer is to use your life to make a difference in somebody else's life. It's that you would use the, the, the knowing of God and the freedom you have and the purpose you have to get on the mission of God, and that's to go make disciples of all the world. I know without a shadow of a doubt, you will never be fulfilled in this life until you are using your life for its ultimate end, and that is to make a difference in the life of somebody else. Are y'all with me? I know that's God's vision for your life. That's what you should be doing, but I don't want to talk to you about that today. I want to talk to you about a vision for what you should be coming. 
Well, let me say it this way. It's not great language, but that you would have a vision for who you are being. Who are you gonna be? My uncle used to say it to me like this in the farm in South Carolina. He'd say, how you gonna act? How you gonna act? He was a bit country. It wasn't great grammar, but it was profound wisdom. Daniel, how you gonna act? In other words, what are you gonna be known for? Because who you are becoming is who people are experiencing. And so what are you gonna become for? Because I don't, I don't know if I, I don't wanna get up here today and go, I've got vision because I do. I've got vision for other campuses in the state of Virginia, absolutely. I've got vision for other churches to be planted like we did in Louisville, 100%. I've got vision for outreach ministries and all kinds. I've got all kinds of vision, but I don't, I don't know when we're gonna fill rooms again. And I don't know when things are gonna be lifted. And I don't know, but I know that you could have vision for your life right now. Here's my heart this morning. I'm not all about building building a larger church. I'm about you building a larger life. I don't know when, when we're going to build church in the way that we, I don't know when those dates and times are coming, but I know today you can build a larger life. I know that today you can build a larger you. I know that you can get greater today. I know that you can run toward destiny today. I know that there isn't a pandemic, there isn't a quarantine, there isn't a lockdown that can stop you from growing large on the inside, having vision for your life and becoming everything God wants you to be. And so if I could on a day when usually I talk about vision for our church, I wanna, I wanna hone on a vision for you. I want you to become a Daniel. Look what the Bible says about Daniel. It says, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. So 120 people divided up to have rulership and authority and leadership and influence with three administrators over them. So you can kind of see the org chart. Y'all follow me? You got three uh, on the top tier. You got 120 leading under each three. It just makes me think like, wow. High capacity guys up top because they're 120 divided by three. That's how many they're each leading. One of whom was Daniel. Daniel was one of the top leaders. And listen to this. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. It didn't say that Daniel in his looks was distinguishing, but he distinguished himself. You see, it was his, he determined in his own heart, I'm gonna distinguish myself. You can determine today that you're gonna distinguish yourself, that you're gonna have exceptional qualities, that there's gonna be something about who you're becoming that is exceptional, something about who you're becoming that distinguishes you. Come on, I want a church full of people that are distinct. When you walk into the job, you're dis- something about you is exceptional. That when you walk into your school, something about you is exceptional. When you walk into your neighborhood, something about you is exceptional, not because you're arrogant or not because you wanna let everybody know how great you are, but because of who you're becoming, everyone is experiencing and it is exceptional. It is distinguished. Come on, somebody. I want you in this year to get the promotion, not because you positioned yourself and not because you kissed up to the right people, but because you had exceptional qualities. I want you to get the raise this year because you had exceptional qualities. I want people to be attracted to Jesus this year because you had exceptional qualities. I want your neighborhood changed, your homeroom changed, your work workplace changed. Why? Because you distinguished yourself. You, like Daniel, determined, I'm going to distinguish myself. Now, here's the deal. It's a choice you make. It won't just happen. You've got to determine, I'm going to distinguish myself. You know what that means? It means you got to change. It means... You're gonna to have to focus on some things and eliminate some things. They're two sides of the same coin. Focus is on one side, elimination is on the other. Growth is two sides of one coin. Growth is on one side and change is on the other. You don't get one without the other, but here's what I believe. I believe that God wants you to have 
a vision for who you're becoming. And this vision is this, that you would distinguish yourself. That means you're gonna do this year. I believe, I believe you're gonna do the hard work of distinguishing yourself of having some things that you value about yourself. Maybe you've never thought about this, but some things that you value that distri- There were some things about Daniel. Go ahead on and read his story sometime. There were some things that he valued that set him apart. It wasn't how he dressed. It, it wasn't the car he owned. It wasn't the house he lived in. It was something deeper than that. It was something he valued that distinguished him, exceptional qualities. There was something in his character. There was something in his heart. There was something in the way that he thought that distinguished himself from everybody else. And I'm just telling you, I'm believing for everybody in our church to rise a little bit higher this year because you've got some vision in your heart to distinguish yourself from everybody else. And I don't know what all, all the things that you should set in your heart. I don't know all the values that, that you should have, but I wanna to propose to you four today that just like Nehemiah went and brick by brick, they began to rebuild the wall. I wanna give you four qualities that I think you can build a life worth living on. You can build a life that distinguishes itself from everybody else. And, and, and I, want, I, want, I want this visual, I hope, to, to stick in your mind, but... Here's, here's number one is as we build a life that is worth living, that we would be known as people that love God. I know you, you, may, you may think like, oh, that, that, kind of, that kind of seems like elementary, but no, no. If you're gonna have a foundation for your life that's worth building, if you're gonna, if you're gonna have some values in your life that you would, you would place this year above everything, the value that I, I, I'm gonna love God. Like, like really love God. Like with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Like, like what Matthew 22 tells us to do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna love the Lord my God with, with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind. All my heart. Not, not like, God, I'll give you, when, when I'm in crisis, then I'm gonna run after God or or not just when, when things aren't going my way, I'm gonna go after God. No, God, I'm gonna love you with all my heart, all my soul, so, so, so my mind, will, and emotions, God. I'm gonna love you with my mind. I'm gonna love you with my heart. I'm gonna love you with my emotions, and I'm gonna love you. God, every part of me, I'm gonna love you with everything I have. I'm, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna put that as the foundational piece of my life, that when people encounter me, I, I, before they even like get in deep conversation. I just want them to see from my life that what distinguishes me is that I'm in love with God. That I'm in love with God, that that it would just ooze out of me, that it would just be a part. I I, I want you to, and and maybe maybe you don't like that, want this, but I, I want this for you. I want you to be so in love with God that when other people are around you, they begin to change their language because they know you love God and you won't participate in that kind of, that, that that when you walk into the gossip circle at work, that they're just like, Oh, never, never mind. Cause, cause they're just like, they, they love God. They don't, they don't jump on the gossip train. They, they don't jump on the talk about negative people. Train. They don't jump on that train. Cause they're, they just, they they love God. Well, what if, what if I get the, what if I get the, the reputation of like a holy roller or no, no, no. I'm just saying what oozes out of me. I'm not judging. I'm not, I'm just in love with God. They see it by my actions. I'm in the house of God every single week. I got like, I got the Bible. I'm reading the Bible every day. I'm praying every day. Every day. Come on, here's how, you, here's how you fall in love with God this year. Develop your closeness with God. Develop your closeness with God. Listen to me. The point of reading your Bible and praying is to get closer to God, not to read your Bible and pray. It's to get close to God. The Bible says, if I draw near to him, he will draw near to me. Well, what if what, if what distinguished you what if the exceptional quality of you is that you were just in love with God? Not in love with what God could give you, not in love with what God could provide for you, but just in love with God. What if you determine I'm gonna distinguish myself, I'm gonna develop closeness with God. 
I'm gonna develop closeness with God in, in time and in the word. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get in the discipline of in the word every day. So what's gonna distinguish me? I'm gonna get in the word every day. I'm gonna pray some every day. I'm just gonna be in a spirit of prayer. Just like, I'm just gonna talk to God at different times in the day. I would rather you talk to God for five minutes, three times a day than, than 15 minutes and, and you're, you're ADD for 20 minutes of it. Y'all follow me? Yes, sir. That you just, it would be a daily conversation. I'm praying always. That doesn't mean that I'm walking around, dear God, think of it just stay on you. Excuse me, I'm talking to God, don't speak to me right now. But I'm, I'm just in this daily constant. God, I'm gonna I'm I'm grow in my worship to you this year, God. I, I don't wanna be worshiping you at the end of the year the same way I was worshiping you at the beginning of the year. I'm gonna grow. It's gonna distinguish me. It's gonna, it's gonna set me apart. I'm gonna develop my closeness with God. I'm gonna develop my, I'm gonna, de- what, I'm gonna develop my character. So as I develop my closeness with God, God is gonna speak to me. And you know what God's gonna do? He's gonna challenge me. He's gonna challenge me. So I'm gonna develop that I'm gonna stand apart. I'm gonna have exception. This is a life worth living. I'm gonna build a life that's worth living. That I'm in love with God. Passionately in love with God. Number two, if you're gonna build a life worth living, I think the second thing you could do is determine that you're gonna love people well this year. I'm gonna love people well this year. Love God with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The first and greatest commandment. So that's why we start there. It's the first and greatest. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Here's the challenge for some of you. You don't love other people well because you don't love you well. You do live this out. You love your neighbor just like you love yourself. And you're mean to them and you hold grudges against them, and you wanna shame them, and you're easily offended by them because you are loving them just like you love yourself. So maybe maybe brick half is love yourself. (laughs) Begin to allow the freedom of God to flow into your life. Allow the grace of God, realize the grace that's been given to you, and then give that grace away to others. Uh, look Look at this verse in First Thessalonians. I love how Paul said this. He said, we loved you so much. Isn't that amazing? I mean, just think about that. Paul's writing to this church in Thessalonica and he's like, we loved you so much. And we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. It's hard to love people well from a distance. It's, it's hard to love people well when you're constantly giving them the Heisman stiff. Are you following me? He said, not only did we wanna give you the gospel, we gave you our lives as well. We gave you us. We loved you. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying you, you bring everybody in and everybody's your confidant and you're dumping out your whole life to everybody, but I'm just saying you can't love people from a distance. I'll never forget whenever I was in, uh, in undergrad, I, one of my student ministry professors, because that's what I thought I would do my entire life, and I kind of think that's what I'm still doing. I'm just a youth pastor that got the head job. <clears throat> I'll never forget this. He said we, he was out doing ministry one time, and, and it was back in the day when like bus ministry was really big, and there were bus kids in from all over the place, and and vans, and I mean just everything. They were busting people in from all over the place, and, and they were picking people up from underprivileged neighborhoods and bringing them in, and they were ministering to these kids and loving on them, and, 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 they, and they brought this, this one kid, and, and he was like one of the last to be dropped off, and he ended up in this conversation with him, and, and he said, he's asking him how his night was going, did he enjoy it, and, and all this kind of stuff, and the kid gave him this response that really floored him. He said to him, he said, he said, yeah, it's nice, but all y'all care about is my soul. And, and the guy, my professor telling the story, it said it floored him because what the kid was saying to him is you care if I go to heaven, but I'm not sure if you care if heaven comes to earth with me right now. Paul said, I didn't just give you the gospel. 
I gave you my life. I, did, I, didn't just, I didn't just care if check, you know God, check, you find freedom, check, discover purpose, check, you made a difference. I gave you my life too. And here's the deal. You got limited capacity, but you can give somebody your love. You can't give everybody, you, but you can, you, just because you can't do for everybody doesn't mean you shouldn't do for anybody. But you, you can give your life to a group of people. You can give, this is why it's so important that you get into a small group today. That you find some people that you go, not only gospel, but my life as well. I want to love people well. I want to love people that don't think like me. I want to love people that don't look like me. I want to love people that maybe didn't grow up the way that I grew up. But I want to, I want to be marked by someone that loves people well. That I'm, I'm willing to love you enough to encourage you. I'm willing to love you enough to correct you. I'm willing to love you enough to get into your world. I'm willing to love you like Jesus loved me with the bandwidth that I have, I'm willing to love people. I, exceptional quality. A distinguishing quality. I, I, I pray that, that we as a people, us as a church, would be a people that love people well. That, that love people well. That, that not the emotional, the way we've made love in culture of of this feeling and, 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 and I'm, I'm in love and now I'm out of love. That, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says love is a choice. It's choices lead and feelings follow. And whether the feeling ever catches up or not, I can do 1 Corinthians 13. I can be patient with you and I can be kind with you and I can be long suffering with you and I can keep no record of wrong with you because that is a choice. That is a discipline I make. It is who I am becoming. It's who I'm becoming. So Paul said, not only did I give you the gospel, but I gave you our life as well. Just let me ask you this. Who are you giving your life to as well? Who are you giving your life? If you're going to build a life that's worth living, if you're going to rebuild for some of you, have some vision for your life. This is where we're going. I may not get it every right every time, but this is the vision. I can see a preferred future. My preferred future is that people would not know me as someone that is out for myself and that people wouldn't know me as somebody that is bitter and somebody, they wouldn't know me as people that get easily offended and wouldn't see me as someone that's just trying to climb the ladder. But when people think of me, I want them to think they love God and they love people well. It's a distinguishing quality about them. Let me give you... Let me give you number three, it's this, is that you would be a person that pursues excellence. You're like, is this a business talk now? Did we just switch from Bible to business? No, no, look, look at what the scripture says. <clears throat> it says, people were overwhelmed with amazement. He had done everything well. Not halfway, did it well. Somebody shout well. I love this verse. This is one that, that, I don't know, I heard when I was in high school and somehow it stuck with me and just became like the mantra. And I can still hear my dad today in my mind, Daniel, if you're gonna do it, do it the best you possibly can because it honors God. Daniel, if you're gonna do it, if you're gonna take the trash can out, put it by the road nicely. Don't put it out cockeyed, put it out nicely because it honors God. Daniel, if you're gonna do your homework, this one didn't lock in with me, um, do, <laughs> do it well because it honors God. I finally got it later in life. Daniel, whatever you're gonna do, do it with everything. Here's, here's the verse. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, somebody shout whatever. whatever. Do it all for the glory of God. God, I'm gonna bring my very best to you in, in everything that I do. I'm gonna, a distinguishing factor about me. Some of you, you're working in jobs that is not your long-term assignment, but it is what is getting you by right now. And, and what if you didn't show up every day and just go, I'm gonna do the bare minimum, but uh, I'm gonna exceed expectations. I'm gonna do more than they asked me to, and I'm gonna do it better than they asked me to, not because I'm working for the boss, but because I'm working as unto God, because I'm bringing glory to God. Are you following me? Come on, I'm telling you, when you pursue excellence in every area of your life, it's attractive to the world around you. There's some of you that, that you may not have the qualifications on paper for the promotion you want, but if you'd show up every day pursuing excellence, you would get it over other people because they would see the quality that comes because you have a distinguishing factor. Well, what if you were just a, 
maybe I'm getting in your business a little bit. What if you were just to look around your house and be like, excellence, we're gonna pursue excellence. What if you look at the floorboard of your car, staff, and say, I'm gonna pursue excellence. I'm gonna pursue excellence in the way I present myself. Why? Because it honors God. Whether I eat, whether I drink, and in case that didn't cover enough, whatsoever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do. Are you being for real, pastor? Like, when I take out the trash, yeah, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. When I show up to serve, yeah, why, why y'all so much about excellence? It's, is it a show? No, because it honors God. It brings glory to God. Whatever I do, when I do my homework, I'm gonna do it all for the glory of God, student. That's why I'm gonna, I'm gonna pursue the best grade. If a B is you maxing out, then get that B for the glory of God and max out. If it's getting an A, then get an A and max it out for the glory of God. Whatever I do, how I manage my money for the glory of God, I'm gonna pursue excellence, not perfection. Excellence will motivate you. Perfection will limit you. I'm gonna pursue excellence. I'm gonna get better every Every day. At the end of the year, I'm going to be better than I was at the beginning of the year because I'm pursuing excellence in every area of my life. And can I tell you something? Excellence will attract things to you. Look at, look at, look at this in 1 Kings Solomon. She said, this princess came with, with all, the, all this wealth, said, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Listen to this. Indeed, not even half was told to me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. Come on, let's be people that exceed the report. I, I heard they were loving, but they exceeded the report I heard. I heard they were generous, but man, they exceeded the report. I heard they were full of faith, but they exceeded the report I heard. I heard they believed in miracles, but they exceeded the report I heard. Come on, let that be true in your own life personally. I heard they were a person of excellence, but they exceeded the report that I heard. I heard they crossed every T and dotted every I, but they exceeded the report. I heard they loved people, but man, they exceeded the report. I heard that. I heard they loved God, but they exceeded the report. Pursue excellence. I'm getting better. You know what? A pandemic can't stop you from pursuing excellence. A pandemic can't stop you from pursuing so in loving people and loving God, this is who you're becoming. Put you in a prison, Apostle Paul, and I'll sing praises to God because who I'm becoming, nothing can stop. You can't stop me from loving God. Put me in a prison, and then when the doors open, I'm gonna make sure everybody else gets out of the prison. Why? Because nothing can stop me from loving people. Are you following me? I'm gonna exceed expect. What if you just made that your determination this year? Who I'm becoming. I don't know what it's look like. I don't know when this is gonna grow. I don't know if the business is gonna take off. I don't know if I'm gonna get the promotion. I don't know if I'm gonna get laid off. I don't know if I'm gonna be in school or doing it virtually. I don't know if it's gonna be hybrid. I don't know if I'm gonna get accepted into that college. I don't even know if they're gonna be doing on-site classes in the fall. I don't know if I'm gonna make the team or are they canceling the whole winter sports? Are they canceling spring? I don't, you can't control all that, but you know what you can control is who you're becoming. Who you're becoming. I don't know if you're gonna grow a large business, but you can grow a large life. When you grow large on the inside, so determined, I'm, I don't know, maybe you wanna add bricks, but I'm just saying at the bare minimum, let's love God. Let that be a distinguishing factor of who you are. A distinguishing factor that you love people. A distinguishing factor that you pursue excellence. It's not something that'll just happen to you, you gotta run after it. I'm telling you, when you do, it'll attract things to you. And the, and the number four, finally, is this. Let it be the distinguishing factor that you're this kind of person, that you're life-giving. That you would be life-giving. What, what do I mean by that? I mean this here. The second Corinthians says, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich. 
having nothing and yet possessing everything. You know what the apostle Paul was saying is, can't control my circumstances. I can't control what's going on around me, but you know what? I'm always rejoicing in the middle of it. Here's what he's saying is that the circumstances aren't affecting my attitude. My attitude is affecting the circumstance that I'm in the middle of sorrowful things. You know, the apostle Paul, he was beaten. He was snake bit. He was shipwrecked. I mean, he went through it. And what did he say in the middle of it? I've determined I'm going to be life giving in the middle of it. It doesn't mean that I'm faking it. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm living with blinders. No, 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 no. I, I'm seeing the reality of what's happening, right? Nehemiah went, what did he say? The walls are down. The gates are burned. He inspected the reality of it. And some of you may feel like that the walls of your life were burned down in 2020, that, that some of the gates were destroyed. I'm not saying you, you, you act like none of that's there. I'm just saying you determine I'm going to set my attitude. I, remember, I can hear my dad over and over again in my head right now. Daniel, watch your attitude. Daniel, watch your attitude. Your attitude will determine your altitude. If he said that to me once, he said it to me a thousand times. Your attitude will determine your altitude. And it's so true. You get to decide, am I going to be a life-giving person? Can, I, can, can, we just, can we determine as a church, we're going to change the narrative? I mean, you, you got a choice. Well, did you see that executive order? Well, when is the ban going to live? When are you going to wear a mask? Not wear a mask. When is the pandemic going to be over? Who knows? Who knows? But in the middle of it, I can rejoice. In the middle of it, I can praise God. In the middle of it, I can go, I know God has good plans for me. They're to prosper me and not to harm me, to give me a hope and a future. I can know that not one good promise of the Lord has ever failed me. I can know that He is greater is He that is in me than He that is working the world around me. I'm gonna be life-giving. You have a choice. You can walk up into work and, and I've been guilty of this this year. I'll be real honest. You mean last year, pastor? No, I mean this year. We're only 31 days in. And I've been guilty of it. I've been guilty of negative Nancy. I've been guilty of, when's this going? I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. As the old preachers would say, I know who holds the future. And I'm good with that. And I've just determined I'm going to get up in the day and I can choose my attitude. I can choose if I'm going to be a life-giving person. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You know why the Bible sometimes say, the writer would say, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. I think they were talking to themselves. They were saying rejoice. All right. Again, I say rejoice. Sometimes you got to tell yourself how to feel. Sometimes you got to tell yourself how to think. Sometimes you got to tell yourself how to speak. Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. I'm going to build a life that is life giving. And in a negative world, in a negative world, when you're a positive voice, you'll be that city set on a hill. You'll be that light that's not under a bushel. You'll be that person that people will be attracted to. Why? Because let your light show, so shine before men. What is the Bible saying there? That in a dark world, when you light up your light, they'll see you and they'll bring glory to your Father in heaven. So let your light show, be a life-giving person. I'm gonna speak life into the situation. I know it's bad. I know you're in pain, but greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. I know you don't know what the end of the day is going to come. I know you don't know if they're going to downsize or lay off, but he holds you in the palm of his hand and he won't let you slip out. I know that you don't know what's going to happen with your body. And I know that the sickness isn't turning and I know we're praying for healing, but even if healing doesn't come to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I know that you've lost all strength, but greater is he that is in me 
than he that is in the world. Come on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna default to life giving. That when the enemy attacks with negative, I'm gonna default to the word of God. I'm gonna default to what Jesus has said. I'm gonna default to what the word says about me, about my situation, about your situation. I'm gonna determine, I'm gonna walk around speaking life. Here's why it's so important. I love this quote from John Maxwell. He says this, people may hear your words, but they feel your attitude. They may hear your words, but they feel your attitude. So let me ask you, what are people feeling from you in this season? What are they feeling from you in this season? Be life giving. Because I'm a little less concerned about building a large church. And I'm really motivated to help you build a large life. A life that makes a difference. A life that does what we are pre-wired to do. And that is our ultimate end to be on the mission of Jesus. Making a difference in the lives around us. So who are you becoming? What bricks are you laying in your life? What distinguishing factors about you? This may not be at all, but I think it's a great starting point that you would love God with all your heart, that you'd love others, you'd pursue excellence, and that you'd be a life-giving person. Church, let me ask you this. What if, what if all of us decided that we were gonna distinguish ourselves, that, that, that has the idea that we have a part to play, that we have work to do in ourselves. Do you know the Bible says in Luke chapter two, verse 42, that Jesus grew and the growing there is a passive growing. It's it's what normally happens to a kid when they grow. There's not, they don't have to do any work for their torso to get longer, their legs to grow. But then Luke, I think 2.52 says that he grew in stature and favor with God and man. That type of growth is an active growth. It's an intentional growth. It is a predetermined decision that I'm gonna get better. So you gotta make the predetermined decision. I'm gonna love God. I'm gonna love people. Pursue excellence. It'll be life-giving. Will you pray with me? No matter where you're watching from, hang with us just a moment. Just pray with me right where you're at in your living room, in your car, in a coffee shop somewhere around the world, no matter where you are. Who you're becoming matters more than what you're doing. Some of you got goals for the year. I'd encourage you to make those secondary to your growth. Growth proceeds your goals, let me say it this way, who you're becoming precedes what you're doing. So who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? Is there anything that distinguishes you from everybody else around you? For some of you, you've, you've, faith, you've approached your faith in a what am I doing mindset. And because of it, you've checked off a bunch of religious boxes, but you've missed the most important step of being a child of God. You know, the people like to say that we're all children of God. And the truth is we're all creation of God, but until we place our faith in Jesus, we're not all children of God. It's Him who gives us the right to become sons and daughters of God. We do that by receiving the free gift of salvation. We do that by not striving, but by receiving. We receive that gift by admitting where we're at, which is we're sinners, we're separated from God. And holding on to his free gift that if we'll confess with our mouth, believe in our heart, that God raised Jesus from the dead, we will be saved, we'll be forgiven, our lives will be changed. And so I wanna lead you in a simple prayer if that's you today. You'd say, Pastor, that's me. I I know that I'm far from God, I don't wanna be. 
I don't wanna, I wanna build my life worth living on the foundation of Jesus. So if that's you, just join me in this prayer right now. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I believe you died for me. I believe God raised you from the dead. Today I make you my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, we believe that you got saved. We believe that your sins are forgiven according to the Bible. It's a day of brand new beginning. The Bible says if anybody be in Christ, all the old things have passed away and everything becomes new in your life. And, and this newness is a journey and we wanna help you take that journey. And, and so right there in the chat room, you can let us know if you made that decision. And, and another, the best way to do it though is to just text us. Get your mobile device wherever you are in the world right now and text LCS, LCS to 94,000. I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Fully Alive. I wanna help you in this journey of becoming who it is that God wants you to become. We love you so much. Next week, begin a brand new series called Rattled, all about the, what to do when life shakes your joy. Come on, we're gonna be life-giving. We need to be joy-filled people. I think it's gonna be a powerful four weeks. Hey, I hope today's message was helpful for your life. I wanna tell you, you should subscribe. The reason why, you can get content pushed to you all the time. You don't have to wonder if you ever missed anything. And also, I want you to think about giving. By giving, you can help us take this message to so many other people that are in need of some hope, need of some encouragement, and you can be a part of making a difference in the life of so many people. Look forward to seeing you right back here next time.